Hello and good afternoon. My name is Renee Bradshaw with NetIQ, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our webinar today. Today, we are very excited to have as our guest speaker Don Capelli, the Technical Manager of the CERT Insider Threat Center at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, CERT is an organization devoted to ensuring that appropriate technologies and system management practices are used to not only resist attack on network systems, but also limit damage and ensure continuity of critical services in spite of a successful attack. CERT is part of the Software Engineering Institute, which is a federally funded research and development center operated by Carnegie Mellon. Today, Don will be discussing recent insider threat research, including the latest trends in insider crime profiles. She will also discuss proven mitigation strategies to prevent insider data breaches. So before delving into the agenda and introducing Don formally, uh, I want to reiterate a few housekeeping notes. At, you know, at the end of the presentation, we will have time for Q&A, so do feel free to enter your questions into the Q&A box at the lower half of the screen, the screen. We'll answer as many as we can, and if time runs out, we will endeavor to answer you by email. Also at the end of the presentation, we have a quick survey that we'd like you to take. So again, make sure your pop-ups are disabled because you want to respond to the survey and have a chance to win a free iPad. So with that, let us delve into the agenda. First of all, we're going to begin with Don. Don will introduce us to the CERT Insider Threat Center and then take us through the merit model of insider IT sabotage. She'll then discuss various mitigation strategies to prevent insider threat, utilizing actual case study examples. Then I'm going to wrap up with a focus on a specific type of mitigation strategy, file integrity monitoring. And I'll illustrate also with an actual case study from one of our successful customers. And as I said, we'll wrap up the session with a Q&A. So without further ado, let's um, introduce Don Capelli. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to Don. In addition to the, her technical management roles and chairmanship that you see up on the screen, she's a respected author of research publications and a frequent guest speaker at national and international venues. Most recently, Don presented at the RSA conference in San Francisco. She has years of experience in software engineering, technical project management, information security, and research. She's respected and a key figure in the area of insider threat. So we're very happy to have her here with us today, and our hope is that you find your time with her today as valuable as we have here at NetIQ. So without any further delay, I'm going to turn it over to Dawn. Dawn? Thank you, Renee. I'm going to be talking to you very um, well, within about 25 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about monitoring strategies for detection of insider IT sabotage. That's just the legal notice that they make us put in our presentation, so let's get to the agenda. I'm going to start by telling you about the Third Insider Threat Center. Then we will talk about the merit model of insider IT sabotage, which really goes over the patterns of how do these IT sabotage crimes evolve over time? Who does it? How do they do it? Why do they do it? And what do they do? And then we'll get into the mitigation strategies of what can you do about it. Before I start, I'd like to talk about what we mean when we talk about a malicious insider. This is not the definition. This is our definition. So, uh, you know, you have to... Insider threats can be unintentional data leakage, but in CERT, we have not looked at that. What we have looked at are current or former employees, contractors, business partners, really anyone who has or had authorized access to your systems, your data, your network, and intentionally committed some kind of a crime using that access. So that's what we're going to be focusing on today is intentional malicious insider activity. We've been working on this area for a decade in CERT. We started 10 years ago collecting every case of insider crimes that we could find. At first, we didn't really know what we were going to do with all of those cases. But over time, we found that we were seeing distinct patterns in each type of crime. And we created what we call crime models or crime profiles. And based on those patterns, we're now coming up with mitigation strategies for what can you do about those crimes. This gives you a snapshot of the types of crimes in our database. At this point, we have over 550 crimes total. 
We have 122 cases of insider IT sabotage. Those are the ones that we'll be talking about today. Those are the cases in which the insider really wanted to cause harm. They wanted to harm the organization or harm a person. And so we'll talk as we go through here about who commits this type of crime, how, why, what, when, and where. Then you can see the other types of crimes. We have fraud, 170 cases, theft of intellectual property, 86, espionage, that's 120, and then we have 45 miscellaneous cases. This shows you the body of work in CERT, and the reason that I show you this is so that you understand where all of our information comes from. I told you about the cases. We collect every bit of information we can find about those cases. So we don't only look at the technical issues in the cases, we also look at the non-technical. So we look at who are these people, what was happening in their life, particularly at work. Um, what was happening in the organization at the time. And we found that this all, the big picture is really important to understand in order to mitigate these crimes. We also do assessments. We created an insider threat assessment based on the cases. And so using those 550 cases, we identified more than 4,000 issues of concern that enabled the insider to attack. Now, based on those 4,000 issues of concern, we created an assessment which we now use to go out to organizations and look across the organization at technical issues as well as non-technical issues, business process, HR, management, legal, and we look at what are your vulnerabilities to insider threat. Now, because we're out there and we see what is happening, we're doing these assessments so we know what organizations are doing that works and we know what doesn't work. We know where the gap areas are. So in our lab, we focus on how can we come up with new controls that will help with those gap areas. And in addition, let's transition the good things that we're seeing out there that are working and make sure that everyone understands what they should be doing. So the lab is really our central focus right now because we're developing solutions. So now let's just, before we go into sabotage in depth, let's take a quick look at the other types of crimes. So first of all, fraud. Insider fraud is typically committed by current employees they're non-technical, low-level positions, so help desk, customer service. They're, fraud is usually committed by people who are not well paid, they don't have a great career path ahead of them, and yet they have access to your most sensitive information. And it's fairly equally split between male and female. Now, they typically steal personally identifiable information, credit card information. They use their authorized access at work, normal working hours. They basically do what they do every day. The thing is, about half of these people are recruited to steal that information from someone from outside. And another kind of crime that we put in this broad category are crimes in which the insiders are paid by outsiders usually to modify information. So in other words, maybe they modify financial information and move it into their own bank account, or they, mod they create illegal driver's licenses for pay from outside. Those also fall into this fraud category. Now we're going to move on to theft of intellectual property. This is theft, again, but it's a different kind of theft. This is theft of trade secrets, um, scientific formulas, business plans, strategic plans. That type of information is very different than the fraud cases. This kind of theft is committed by current employees, again, but most of these people steal the information within 30 days of announcing their resignation. This is typically committed by the people who created the information scientists, programmers, engineers, or salespeople. Most of these people are male. Um, we already talked about what they steal, but once again, they use authorized access during normal working hours at work. And about half of these people actually are part of an insider crime ring. 
So now we're going to get into the meat of today's presentation, which is IT sabotage. These are cases, again, where the insider wants to cause harm. We have a lot of cases involving logic bombs, malicious code. This is, these are the really severe cases where systems are wiped out, data is wiped out. Um, people are framed for the crime. Customers can't get to their information. Um, so that, these are very severe crimes. And these insiders do not want to cover up what they're doing. They want the big bang. So more security tools are available out there. So you would think that you could detect this kind of activity. But the number of insider incidents continues to grow. Why is that? It's because insiders are in. They don't have to get in. They have access, they have the knowledge of how your systems work, and they have the opportunity. So our objective is to come up with practical strategies for effectively implementing those tools that are out there to detect illicit insider activity. And we'll use actual case examples to show what we mean. This is what we call the MERIT model of insider IT sabotage. MERIT stands for Management and Education of the Risk of Insider Threat. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly, but the basic points that I want you to see are in this bottom left-hand corner, we have what we call personal predisposition. What this means is the people who commit insider IT sabotage are typically very technical users um, and the thing is, you don't have to worry about your whole IT department. The people that commit these types of crimes are those few in your department that really don't get along with people, can't take criticism. No one looks back after these IT sabotage crimes and says, he was such a nice guy, I never would have expected it. Secondly, what happens is some kind of a precipitating event occurs. So there are layoffs, there's no raise, a new boss comes in, this person's put on a new project that they don't like. And as a result, they become disgruntled. Now chances are a lot of people there may be disgruntled, but these people don't get over it like normal people. They end up on what we call the HR radar. They're sanctioned, they continue to act out at work, their behavior gets worse and worse, until finally they decide, you know what, I'm going to get these guys. I've interviewed a few of these people, and they describe it as, I see the end coming, and I know I want revenge, and I know I'm going to need to get back into the system after I'm fired. And so now they take up, they start creating what we call unknown access paths. These are those ways that they can get back into the system after they're terminated. So they create backdoor accounts. They plant malicious code. Um, they, one of them installed a remote system administration tool so he could get back in. They modify source code. So this is where you really need to be able to detect the attack. Now let's talk a little more about those unknown access paths because this is what you need to detect. You need to detect those logic bonds. You need to detect the back doors. Detect if they disable the antivirus on their desktop so they can test the virus. Detect that remote network administration tool. So how can you detect these things? Because if you look at these, this is what system administrators, you know, these are very technical people that commit this type of crime. This is what they do every day. They modify scripts, they modify programs, they create accounts. They are the ones that are looking at, at the antivirus and what it's catching. In addition, we saw insiders who downloaded hacker tools like rootkits, password snap sniffers, password crackers. They um, accessed websites that were prohibited by acceptable use policy. They modified the logs to conceal what they were doing. So again, these are all of those technical actions that you need to detect. But yet, as I said, what are they doing? They're doing what they do every day. So our strategies are that you need to, first of all, detect configuration changes, because that's what they're doing in some of these cases alert on suspicious traffic, and monitor for unauthorized accounts. Now, this is nothing new. We've heard all of, all of this before, so what's the problem? 
Well, these are privileged people, so they can insert malicious code anywhere they want, and it's not really going to look like anomalous activity. They also can override your system controls without anyone detecting them. And finally, information overload. You can't watch what everyone is doing every day. So there's great technology out on the market, but how can you use it so that you aren't so buried in noise that you can't find the needle in the haystack. We believe we've come up with some pretty good solution strategies based on our merit model. Knowing what we know about how these crimes evolve over time can help you to implement a solution. First of all, you need to have continuous logging and you need a centralized, secure log server. We have lots of cases where these insiders modify the logs to conceal their activity. They're smart. They know their logs. They know the evidence is right there on the system to convict them, and so they get rid of it. You also need to look at changes that should occur infrequently. So, for example, if, if a malicious insider wants to plant malicious code, he's going to put it somewhere where it's going to execute. Well, we've seen them use operating system files, scripts, and executables because they're executing all the time. They also plant them in stable production systems. We don't have any cases where insiders planted malicious code during the development of a new system. It's always in a production system, in a nice, stable environment. That's not to say that they, they aren't doing it, but the cases that we have, they do it in a production system. And then services killed on the host. If someone does kill the antivirus on their host, you want to be able to detect that because there really probably aren't a lot of good reasons for someone to be doing that. So those are things where those are changes that shouldn't happen very frequently. And so if you do point your tools at detecting and alerting on those types of changes, they probably are worth your time to investigate. Secondly, we say to audit individual actions in the logs for privileged accounts, especially those people on the HR radar. So remember from that merit model, none of these people are just happy and everything's fine at work and suddenly they decide to attack. These people are really on the downward path. They are typically, most of these people actually attack after termination. The ones that don't are on their way to termination. So when you have a privileged, very technical user who is on the HR radar, we recommend that you want to start doing targeted monitoring of what they're doing because those are your, that's your high risk right there of insider IT sabotage. And then do some proactive things like looking at your workstations for potentially offensive tools and audit your access to backup information because another thing that these people do is they destroy the backups. If they want to sabotage your systems, they don't want you necessarily to be able to quickly recover. And so we have plenty of cases where they not only sabotage the systems but also the backups. So let's look at a few case examples. We had one insider who went into the password change program, and all he did was add, added one line that said, when someone goes in and changes their password, before you encrypt it, save it in clear text for me in this file. And so he ends up with a file with all of these employee passwords. Another employee turned off the antivirus on his machine, tested a virus that he downloaded from the Internet, planted that virus inside his his company's source code, rebuilt the source code so he now has new executable and went out and released it to all of their customer systems so that the next morning when they double clicked on his company's icon, it wiped out everything on their systems. And because this was an integrated hardware and software platform, it actually required his company to physically send someone to every single customer site to replace the hardware and software system. A third one, um, this insider went into their source code for a very critical screen, a screen that was so critical that any time someone used it, it immediately sent an alert to the security department so that they would investigate. And what he did was just commented out that one line of code that said alert security, 
and then he could use that screen, and no one knew that he was using it. So now if you think about those cases and think back to the controls that I recommended on that previous slide, hopefully you'll see the connection. Now let's talk about perimeter controls. Privileged users in our cases have solicited assistance from the Internet Underground to commit their crime. In addition, privileged users have used hacker tools against their organization. And in addition, then there's the physical perimeter of the organization. So you need to really think about that perimeter. Are you only protecting the perimeter from what's coming in from outsiders, or are you looking at what your insiders are pulling in through the perimeter? And so our solution strategies are to configure your IDSs not only to look at what's coming in, but also look at what's going out. And you'll see why when I go into a case example. Also to, uh, again, continuous logging. And again, audit individual actions for people who are on the HR radar. And audit failed physical access attempts because in some of these cases we see insiders trying to physically get into areas that they can't and then they go on to get into those areas electronically. So let's look at a few case examples. Um, we have plenty of insiders who downloaded hacker tools for use in their attack. So don't forget that you want to look at what's coming into your perimeter, not only from outsiders pushing them in, but from insiders downloading things. Secondly, this is, this is where that IDS strategy came from because we had an insider who used IRC chat, which was prohibited by policy in his organization, but not prohibited technically. And what he did was he was chatting with his uh, associates on the Internet Underground, and he wanted them to help him to break in and sabotage his company. And so what he did was he exfiltrated credentials to those, to those hackers using IRC chat. And third, um, I already said this really, that we have some insiders who tried to get physical access and then resorted to electronic access. Okay, now let's wrap up by talking about unauthorized accounts. This is a common method for gaining access following termination. Uh, account creation really is not an anomalous activity for many privileged users. That's who creates accounts, your sysadmin. And account audits are very hard to do. They take a lot of time. There are many different kinds of accounts. And so how do you keep an eye on all of those accounts? First of all, um, we recommend that you implement some kind of a script to compare all of your active accounts against your current employee directory. Make sure that there isn't a John Smith account there that is not tied to a current employee. It's such a simple attack vector, and it's one that you really need to be conscious of. Secondly, whenever you do have new privileged accounts created, validate the, legitim the legitimacy of those new accounts. Not just privileged accounts, but even just normal accounts. And finally, really think about your shared accounts, because that's another big attack vector. How many DBA accounts do you have? How many system administrator accounts do you have? What about web admin accounts? What about your certain application sysadmin types of accounts? You need to really think about those shared accounts. They're very difficult to keep under control and to know who has access to them. So uh, these case examples, they, there's a broad range here. Um, the first one, these are very obvious backdoor accounts. Um, these were actually in cases that we have, two different cases. One of them created an account called Batman. Another one created an account called James Bond. And these are the accounts that they used after termination to break back into the system. So, you know, if you were producing a list of new accounts that were created each week, those might jump right out at you as not following the typical naming conventions of your account. The second example is much more difficult to, to counter. This guy knew the end was coming. He saw it coming, just like most of these people do. And he knew his access would be disabled upon termination. And so what he did was he created three VPN accounts. 
one for his boss, one for the VP of sales, and one for the CFO. He just didn't tell them that he created them. Now, these looked like perfectly legitimate accounts. Even if you did an account audit, they were tied to legitimate employees. And so, sure enough, he was fired, and they hired a consulting firm to come in, and they said, just watch remote connections into our network. We know this guy's going to attack. And they sat there for two weeks, and they watched these three different people coming in there after hours, working hard, you know, um, the, these consultants said, well, CFO, VP of sales, of course they're in there working at night. These are highly paid executives. And so right under their nose, he set up his attack and two weeks later wiped everything off of their network. That's a very tough one, and that's why we say don't just look at the list and make sure that they belong to current employees, but validate them with the employees and with their supervisors. When you think about the number of new accounts you create every week, it really is a manageable size, even in a really large organization, as long as you start somewhere. And finally, don't forget about accounts like testing accounts, training accounts, and customer accounts. You, you know, when we talk about account management, you think of everyone's account they use to log in. But these three types of accounts were used in multiple cases because they have access to your applications, to your customer data, to your systems, and typically they just kind of sit there and you just keep reusing them and you don't really think about what, which of your insiders have access to them. So that's the end of my presentation. Um, hopefully you've got some information there that you can take away and use. I have my point of contact here so that you can feel free to contact me for any more information. And I also have our URL for our website. There's a lot of information on our website. It's all freely available. Um, and we also have a blog, which we started uh, late last year. So please visit our website. Take a look. Okay, thank you, Don. Very, very interesting. Uh, I'll leave our point of contact information up there just a little bit longer um, before I wrap up with a couple of points. Okay. So again, I'm Renee Bradshaw. I'm a product marketing manager with NetIQ. And similar to um, what Dawn has experienced when, when she speaks to actual victim organizations, we, we've, we've seen that insider threat is a key area of concern for our customers. And because of that, we're targeting our identity and security solutions towards helping our customers resolve these type of problems. So today I'm going to briefly discuss our approach, our overall approach to um, insider threat, but I'm going to focus on file integrity monitoring and how implementing this mitigation strategy has helped one large global retailer. So any effort or investment to address insider threat, we believe, must at a minimum resolve these three areas. And I think as I go through them, you'll, you'll hear Don's echo in, in your head, hopefully, as, as they, they're very, very familiar. First of all, You've got to ensure that your critical systems are configured to best practice or known good configurations. Uh, according to the recent 2010 Verizon Business Risk Report, this step alone would have addressed over 80% of the breaches they saw. It's been years since we secured the perimeter and made sure we were protected, but today we have to secure critical systems by drawing a perimeter around each asset. For example, the same research indicated that almost 98% of records compromise came from either database, web, or point-of-sale servers. The so bottom line, if you follow known best practices, you will address most of your security risks. Secondly, and now we're getting down to where we're monitoring the privileged user, we've got to proactively manage user privileges throughout the entire life cycle for employees, contractors, and partners. We've got to manage the amount of privileges they have during onboarding, throughout their career, and offboarding. The occurrence of insider breaches, according to the Verizon Business Risk Report, jumped 26% this year, and most of the time they found that it was because the users had more privileges than were needed, either because the privileges were added over time and were not adjusted, or due to inadequate application of controls over the segregation of duty. So we've got to manage to the minimum number of privileged users and then having the minimum privileges required to accomplish their objectives. Thirdly, and what we're going to focus on today, is 
we've got to monitor, their, monitor the activity of these privileged users. What are they doing with the rights granted? And when you consider that once an, perhaps an external attacker, such as one that wants to utilize a malware infection, once an external attacker has access into the system, his or, his account, his or her account activity is indistinguishable from insider activity, the, the scope of insider threat expands exponentially. So for both insiders and outsiders that are masquerading, for better words, as insiders, the key word is watchfulness. So as Dawn stated, you need to detect and investigate on changes that occur infrequently, such as changes to operating system files or other critical files. And as she said, watch for minor policy violations that can be an indicator of future breach activity. So bottom line, unauthorized privilege use should generate alarms and always be investigated. So as you said, basic controls and monitoring can prevent most data breaches. And we have solutions in each of these three areas that I've described. But today, we'd like to focus on the privileged user activity, monitoring that activity, and specifically file integrity monitoring. So I'm putting up this slide so you can ask yourself these questions. I mean, when you're assessing how secure your current IT infrastructure is from breaches associated with insiders or outsiders or partners who gained access to your systems, there are several questions that you can ask yourself to help you self-diagnose whether you're effectively monitoring privileged user activity. How does your organization monitor system and file integrity? Is the monitoring in real time? How are you detecting changes to critical systems like like system files I mean, and the shares? Are you able to investigate unusual changes and alert on those changes? Um, can you alert on unauthorized or unmanaged changes or access? Can you identify anomalous behavior? Can you identify if this rarely access data has been modified? And what about actively auditing individual access with a focus, as Dawn was saying, the need to focus on privileged or high-risk user accounts? Um, because privileged users are often given access to sensitive or critical system and data files, the use of file integrity monitoring can help track access and changes to these critical system files, security log files, data files, or shares. And the solution can help you to rapidly react to unmanaged changes, which can signal a targeted attack on your data. So at this time, we've got a quick polling question that I'd like to introduce, which now that you've got a chance to ask yourself these questions, we want to find out, how, do you, how does your organization, how do you detect and manage changes to critical system files? And we'll give you a few seconds to ponder, ponder your response and take a look at that. But um, you know, it, it's very critical to, to, to watch what your privileged users are, are doing. I mean, the most, the most recent example I can think of is the WikiLeaks example. I mean, in that particular example, you know, Julian Assange, the founder of WikiLeaks, took possession of downloaded diplomatic cables and war documents, other classified secrets from an army private. And this particular gentleman, and Don, you can jump in if you want to. I mean, he had so many indicators. I mean, he had he had prior minor policy violations, and he had posted video messages to friends on YouTube that revealed sensitive information, and it was an infraction, but shortly after he graduated from training as an intelligence analyst security clearance, he was, he was fairly disgruntled, and he was able to, um, as he put, had unprecedented access to classified networks 14 hours a day, seven days a week. So um, he was a classic case of somebody that was, should have been on the HR radar. And file integrity monitoring, in, you know, in, in our opinion, is in this case, you know, where there were system files that were being accessed, there were real-time alerts that could have watched this happening and then enabled, you know, the alerting and the re immediate recognition of the problem security teams. That abuse and, and that breach might have been averted earlier. Okay, so let's see if we can see what the results are. Okay, interesting. So 28% of you do use a file integrity monitoring solution. That's good. And that's about, um, that's about on par with what we've seen at the Verizon report specifically said that about 25% of the corporations that had had breaches reported a 28% um, being compliant to PCI DSS, which again does call out for file integrity monitoring. So that is about what we're seeing, but I think that 
as you're seeing now, violent activity monitoring, if it's implemented, can even help you further reduce your risk for data breach. So, yeah, let's, let's move on. That's very interesting. Thank you for that. Let's talk about voluntary monitoring specifically. Okay. So, again, it is, it's a best practice security control. It, it's been around for quite some time, and it's critical for information protection because of its ability to detect access and changes to critical system files. The actual name was coined as part of the PCI DSS requirement because they wanted to describe the set of activities you needed to be able to protect log files, critical system files, and these data files. And as I said, in the recent Verizon Business Risk Report, about the same percentage of the breached companies were um, in compliance with the specific uh, uh, sections that call out for file integrity monitoring, that being 10.5 and 11.5. So to illustrate a real-world example of file integrity monitoring in action, I just want to briefly take you through a case study of a large public retailer that we helped by implementing an integrated solution that featured file integrity monitoring. Okay, this is a large global retailer. And for a large public retailer, the two dominant mandates are PCI, DSS, and SOC. All the others, such as the Massachusetts privacy regulations, always also apply. The IT environment of this particular retailer was highly distributed and outsourced, so they were very keenly aware of the fact that they were under a specific security threat because of physically distant insiders, because they had a large amount of partners. They were very up-to-date on the, um, different, the changing nature of security threats. In fact, they had recently experienced a disruptive cost of data breach from an outsider, and they had also recently experienced a failed audit due to, in, in large part, not being able to meet uh, the file integrity monitoring um, requirement. So they were very incented to um, seek a solution that would help them avoid data breaches as well as address audit findings. So to achieve this objective of addressing the security and audit gap, they were faced with putting in place sufficient controls and monitoring across the entire highly distributed database, that, excuse me, enterprise, with a special focus on those point of sale solutions, stations in the stores. So their specific areas of focus included protecting credit cards and other customer information, ensuring the integrity of the security log and audit log, and ensuring systems were properly configured and ensuring the integrity of system files. They also wanted to be able to centrally aggregate and analyze the information from various security solutions, not only those that we proposed. So how did we help them? Well, first and foremost, we helped them by providing file integrity monitoring of critical servers and point of sale, state, point of sale stations. Right off the bat, that helped them close their audit gap findings uh, because they were able to meet the FIM requirement. And it did help them, for example, um, better monitor official shares, hosting approved applications. That was something that they wanted to do specifically. It gave them the real-time visibility, the privileged user activity, and you know, what they were accessing, what, what they were accessing, what shares they were accessing. It, it helped them identify anomalous behaviors, such as you know, um, accessing critical files when they shouldn't have or accessing them more frequently than they should have. It helped them alert on changes to these critical files so that the security teams could act in real time on these threats. And our particular solution was able to, to give them rich analysis capabilities because we were able to provide the information about who accessed the critical files, what they were accessing, when, and where did they access the file, how did they do it. So that proved very valuable to them. And um, also, and additionally, the, the, our best practice approach to implementing the solution was this retailer was we provided integration of NetIQ and third-party security solutions. We did provide the central log management and real-time event analysis across their selected application whitelisting and mobile data device monitoring solutions, working in conjunction with our file integrity monitoring solutions. And we also provided them work, workflow automation using best-in-class tools because they were particularly interested in, in using their other security and operational tools with ours, and they also felt this process of automation that we provided them with was going to long-term 
enabled greater flexibility as they moved toward adapting highly, more highly virtualized infrastructure and then a public and private cloud at some point. So by utilizing this integrated and automated approach, we enabled them to scale the security operations so that they could meet the needs of their business, not slow them down. In the end, they were able to quickly close their audit findings immediately because they now have file integrity monitoring. And we helped close the gaps in data security of the in-store systems, the point of sale systems, and most importantly, provided critical cardholder security. So that concludes our um, presentation for today. As I said, I, I was going to be brief so we could get to the Q&A. Um, here you see a couple more um, resource links that you can go to. We've got a, several white papers up there that you can continue your research journey on. And as I said, we're going to uh, shortly here um, put up a pop up a survey that you can take so that you can enter for a chance to win an iPad. So with that, um, I think it's time to entertain some questions. And I think we've got a number coming in. So we can push the survey, and we'll start answering questions. OK. OK, this one is for Don. Uh, Don, isn't there a conflict when then when HR strategies that involve managing people out after a review period to avoid an unfair dismissal claim. So it seems like, seems like they're asking, is there a conflict with HR with these type of monitoring solutions that, that you're putting forward? That is a big concern. Um, we, we have worked with large organizations not many, but a few, who actually did put policies and procedures in place successfully working with their legal team. So the key here is that it takes time. Um, it, it probably will take you three to six months to actually get a new policy in place uh, where HR and information security and management all can work together as, as I was suggesting. Um, I have also talked to attorneys from the DOJ, and they told me that the important thing is that, number one, you have a very clearly defined policy that lays out exactly what you mean by on the HR radar. So you have to spell out these are the behaviors, these are, you, you, you probably already have HR policies for this is the, this is the disciplinary escalation path. And so part of that then will lay out at this point, we will have targeted monitoring started by information security. So first of all, you have to have a very clearly defined policy. And secondly, it has to be consistently enforced. So if you have a policy saying any time we have a privileged system user who gets reported to HR and after two sanctions, you know, is put on notice, we will start targeted monitoring. If you have one guy who's always been a pain in the neck and you immediately start monitoring him, but you have another guy who meets that threshold, but he's a really nice guy and he's been going through a lot of problems at home, and so we're going to let him slide. That's where you can have a lawsuit. So first of all, clearly defined policy, and secondly, consistently enforced. OK. Another question that we got was, and I guess because they didn't hear it in, in the presentation, so they're wondering, how much benefit then is it to do background checks for IT staff and or corporate awareness training? Do those have any benefits? Yes. Well, OK. Let me qualify that. Do I have any empirical evidence? No. But um, based on our cases, we when we first looked at IT sabotage, I think the number was like 39% of the people who committed IT sabotage had a previous arrest. So they weren't necessarily for cyber crimes, but they had previous arrests for other types of crimes. Many of them were actually violent, like domestic abuse, um, I think we even had a rape. So, you know, they had a previous arrest history. Now, does that mean you shouldn't hire anyone with a previous arrest? That's your call, not mine. But it's good to know who are these people that you're basically giving the keys to the kingdom to. So um, I think background checks, you should 
definitely should do so you know who it is you're hiring. And secondly, um, oh, corporate awareness training. We we have a common sense guide on our website. It's called the Common Sense Guide to Prevention and Detection of Insider Threats. And it's been out there for years, and it last month it still was the number one download on the CERT website. So it's a, it, it's a very popular document. And throughout there, we talk about security awareness training quite a bit. Um, you know, you not only need to tell your employees, here are the rules, but tell them why. Because a lot of times, you know, you may say you cannot share your passwords. But if you don't tell them why, if you don't tell them, hey, if you share your password with your coworker and your coworker uses your account to commit a crime, all the evidence is going to point to you. Um, you know, that might be a little more effective in getting them to think twice before sharing their passwords. And that's just one example. So, yes, I think there is a big benefit to corporate awareness training. Okay. Let's see. So we have a question about wanting to understand the how are companies quantifying potential economic impacts of different kinds of threats? So, um, Don, I'll hand that off to, to you in a little bit, but from what, from what we've seen is that, you know, we, we have an idea of what the cost of the typical data breach is, and, and that's, that's pretty much at about $200 per record. So, um, and that the average organizational cost, and this is from a Ponemon study that, that just recently came out, so the average organizational cost of a data breach is about $6.75 million. But, um, of course, that is linearly related to the size or magnitude of the breach event. So um, in terms of different types of threats, do you have any, at the, you know, can you quantify the impact, Don? Well, we do a survey every year with uh, CSO Magazine and the Secret Service. And mm -hmm. one of the questions we ask, we do ask the cost of your average security event, but um, we find those numbers to be a little unreliable because you'll have huge num outliers that throw those numbers off. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions we ask is who, which, which incidents are more costly, insider incidents or outsider? And um, last year, according to the survey, 67% of the people that had suffered both said that the insider incidents were more costly. Wow. That's very interesting. So did they say, I mean, what were the what was making it so much more costly? I don't know. Yeah. We didn't get into those details. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you a lot of these insider cases in our database are very costly. Um, millions and millions of dollars. Wow. Okay. Here's another one asking about cert analysis. Did did, they, did you detect any trends involving outsourcers or cloud system admins acting as insiders? In your um, we actually have an article on our website that's called Insider Threats from Trusted Business Partners. Okay. And in that article, we look at um, outsourcing as well as contractors. Mm -hmm. So yes, we did, but... Um, the outsourcing cases, that accounts for a lot of the fraud. I shouldn't say a lot of the fraud. Mm -hmm. um, the outsourcing cases primarily involved fraud, um, where you had help desk, you know, types of employees. We don't have all that many cases, though, mm -hmm. involving outsource. Not that many? No. Okay. What about when you have um, you know, outside attackers that come in masquerading um, as insiders? We are just starting to look at that now. So we're doing another study right now in conjunction with the Secret Service, and it's funded by the Department of Homeland Security, where we're collecting not only insider cases, but also cases where outsiders get in. And we're comparing the two because we're trying to look at what controls that we recommend for insiders would also be effective for outsiders. Okay. So I can't answer that question yet, but I will be able to um, in about six months. At our next webinar, hopefully. <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's see. We've got a lot of questions for you, Don, sir. So how would you advise, if somebody took note that, 
you recommended at one point continuous logging. So they're wanting to know how can you, you know, what's a good recommendation to do continuous logging while avoiding increasing workloads for, for their already busy staff? Yeah, that's exactly why we started our lab because like I said, there are lots of tools out there, but those tools just generate so much data that no one knows what to look at. And we have former information officers, security officers on our team, the insider threat team, who understand that problem, and that's who's working in our lab. And that's where we bring in those behavioral aspects of the crime. So for instance, we know that most insiders who are going to steal intellectual property do it within 30 days of resignation. So we're putting together solutions in our lab that integrate your account management system, your HR system, and your email logs. Um, and so automatically it correlates all of that in and a log correlation engine that puts all of that information together and automatically looks for insiders who are within that 30-day window who are doing things like putting files on USB drives or emailing them outside of your network, emailing them to a competitor, emailing them outside the country. So that's exactly what we're doing is trying to look at ways of putting all of these tools together using our behavioral models so that we really can prioritize the alerts mm -hmm. that you need to look at. Right. I think that's the key, being able to prioritize. Right. Yeah. Because we're getting a lot of questions about, well, you know, who, how should I prioritize? And, and you gave some great examples, but it just, you know, we, through talking with customers, we've seen that the most damaging breaches are caused by authorized users, users with the elevated privileges, and those tend to be system and network admins who just aren't being monitored effectively. So um, I think that the key is just monitor, monitor the privileged users in real time. And then, you know, if there are some that are on the HR radar, monitor and audit their activity definitely. Yeah, and actually, um, for IT sabotage, it's the privileged users, but mm -hmm. for theft of intellectual property, it's scientists, engineers, programmers, business people. For fraud, it's the low-level help desk, customer support types of people. So that's what our assess. That's why our assessment it, it boils all of those 550 crimes, 4,000 areas of concern into a one-week assessment that we can come in and and help an organization to really self-assess how do I compare to those issues that made those 550 organizations be a victim. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to just give, you know, blanket advice in an right. hour. Right. But <laughs> we can be very helpful in a week. <laughs> right, right. And we're getting a lot of questions around, you know, what what's the relative, are there more, is there, you know, what's the relative, ratio between insider attacks and outsider attacks and and you know do we have more than just anecdotal information that the level of insider attacks is, is rising um, you, do you want to start off sure that um, we ask those questions in our survey every year and so we've been doing that survey for seven years and every year consistently it has been showing insiders to outsiders at around one-third insiders, two-thirds outsiders. But don't forget that most of 67% said the insider attacks were more costly. Right. This year, the number actually changed for the first time in all those years where insider attacks dropped down to like 25, 27%. And so we're actually encouraged by that number because We've been doing this work for 10 years, <laughs> and finally we feel like, wow, maybe maybe people are, maybe it's because in the lab we're now coming up out with solutions and people are getting, you know, coming up with some effective solutions for stopping these things. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh, here's a question, um, interesting. Um, they're wanting to know if the attacks that you've seen, are they... How have they changed over time? I mean, are, are they the same type that are happening in 2002? What's the, how is the, what's the most prevalent type of attack that you've seen over the years? 
Well, interestingly enough, when we started collecting cases, um, we saw the most, the biggest category was IT sabotage. But then they started um, implementing the data breach laws. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the fraud bar really jumped and has continued to jump. So it's hard for us to tell what's really happening out there because it depends on what people are forced to report. Um, but as far as, you know, the, the types of crimes, the way they happen, they, they're so consistent. These models that we created you know, like seven years ago, they still fit. Whenever we see a new case, it always looks like the model. What changes are the technical methods, and that's why we continue to collect cases. Otherwise, we would just say, okay, we're done. Why keep collecting? The right. technical methods continue to evolve, and that's, you know, that's why we continue to add those to our data, to our mitigation strategies, to the lab, to the assessment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, well, we still have a few minutes for any other questions as we come up on the hour. Okay, well, coming up on 2 o'clock, and um, if there are any questions that come in, late-breaking late breaking questions, we'll endeavor to answer them via email. But um, on, on behalf of Don, I'd like to thank you all for your participation, especially the Q&A at the end. Very good questions. and. Um, we hope that you enjoyed the presentation and gleaned a lot of useful information that you can use. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for inviting me. Mm -hmm.